Here is the second structural design pattern from the Gang of Four design pattern book. This one is called Bridge Pattern and it is a pattern you use when you want to strictly separate an interface hierarchy from its implementation hierarchy. I'll start with a quick summary of what we are trying to accomplish with this pattern. The bridge pattern is a good choice when you are trying to accomplish the following. You need to combine two or more orthogonal class hierarchies. You want to bind an implementation to a class at a runtime. You need to clean up a proliferation of classes resulting from a coupled interface with lots of implementations. You want to share an implementation among multiple objects. Let's go through these points. OK, so the best way to explain how the bridge pattern works is through a concrete example. Let's imagine for a second that we're building a charting library. This is a library that can generate complex pie charts, bar charts, line graphs, and so on. You're going to need lines, circles, and rectangles to draw these charts. So let's start building the shape object hierarchy you will probably end up with something like this. These are some fundamental shapes that make up a chart. But you also have to add an implementation. We are going to need some kind of drawing interface to export the shapes to an SVG image so that we can display the shape on a web page and maybe also another class to render the shape to an OpenGL graphics device. So now your object hierarchy looks like this. You can see the problem here. Each implementation class appears in three places in the shape object graph. This leads to platform code being spread out all over the object graph, instead of being neatly contained. The problem here is that we are trying to shoehorn the implementation class hierarchy into the shape class hierarchy. And these two have nothing in common, and attempting to combine them only leads to a very large object tree. The solution is to completely separate the two object hierarchies and use a special bridge to connect them. The modified object hierarchy will then look like this. In this new design, the shape class acts as a bridge between the shapes and the drawing API. It holds a reference to an instance of draw API and defines an abstract high-level drawing interface. The line, square and rectangle classes inherit from shape and implement the high-level drawing interface by calling the low-level drawing interface provided by the draw API class. By initializing a shape with different API instances, you can make any shape draw itself on any API. A big benefit of the bridge pattern is that it reduces the number of classes. In the previous example, I needed 10 classes to draw my three shapes 
on two platforms. But with the bridge pattern, I've cut the number of classes down to seven. The pattern also improves code maintainability. If you do not use the pattern, you end up with implementation codes being spread out all over your class hierarchy. But with the pattern, all the implementation code lives in a single class within its own independent hierarchy, which makes it much easier to maintain. Another benefit of having the implementation in a separate class is that you can initialize it at runtime. The pattern allows you to define an interface at compile time and specify the actual implementation at runtime. And finally, the pattern provides the freedom to make future changes. With interface and implementation completely decoupled, you can make changes to both without breaking the architecture. As long as the bridge between the two holds, everything will keep working. Okay, here is the UML diagram of the bridge pattern. The object hierarchies are on the left and right hand side of this diagram. On the left, we have the interface hierarchy with an abstract base class called abstraction. This class sets up an abstract high level interface shown in the diagram as a single operation method. And it also holds a reference to an implementor instance. There's a concrete interface called redefined abstraction. This class derives from the abstraction base class and implements the high level methods. It does this by calling the low-level methods provided by the implementor instance. And on the right is the implementation hierarchy. The top-level class is called implementor, and it implements some kind of abstract low-level API. In the diagram, the API consists of a single method called operation imp. There are also two concrete implementation classes called Concrete Implementor A and Concrete Implementor B. These two classes derive from the Implementor base class and implement the low level interface. Now you can clearly see the bridge in this diagram. It is the reference to Implementor held by the abstraction class. To demonstrate the bridge pattern, I'm going to actually implement the example I talked about at the start of this lecture. So, I am going to build a charting library that uses the bridge pattern to separate an abstract shape hierarchy from an implementation hierarchy. I'm going to use the exact same classes I talked about earlier. So. I will implement the pattern with the following classes. OK, let's look at the code. I will start with the shape class. You can see that it's an abstract class that sets up an abstract interface with a single draw method. This is my high-level interface, a single method for the shape to draw itself. If we look at the class constructor, then you can see that you have to call it with an instance of draw API. The instance gets stored in this protected field here, which makes it available to subclasses. This reference is the bridge 
that connects the shape classes with the API classes. Now, before I move on to the concrete shape classes, let's first take a look at the API classes. Here is the draw API class. And you can see that it is an abstract class that sets up a single abstract draw line method. And here are two concrete API classes. SVG API and OpenGL API. Each class inherits from draw API and implements the draw line method. You can see here that I am outputting the actual SVG and OpenGL commands to draw a line. This is where you would put the actual implementation codes to draw a line. OK, now let's look at the concrete shape classes. Line, square and rectangle. Each class inherits from shape and implements the draw method. You can see in the line class that the implementation simply uses the draw API instance to draw a single line. But now, let's take a look at the square class. It also implements the draw method, but it makes four API calls to draw the four line segments that make up a square. Note that the square class has no idea how to draw itself as a bitmap or SVG image. And conversely, the draw API classes have no idea what a square is. The two object hierarchies are completely independent. OK, finally, here is the main program method. You can see that it declares a shape variable, instantiates it with a line instance, and initializes it with the OpenGL drawing API. It then asks the shape to draw itself. And down here is the same code all over again. But now it's a rectangle being initialized with an SVG drawing API. Let me run the program so we can see what's happening. I'm compiling the code now. And I'm running the program now. And there you go. One line drawn with OpenGL vertex commands and one rectangle drawn with SVG commands. Everything works. OK, here is a quick checklist you can use to implement the bridge pattern. First, identify two or more orthogonal class hierarchies in your application. The separation can be along the line of abstraction versus platform, or domain versus infrastructure, or front-end versus back-end, or interface versus implementation. Then design an abstract client-oriented interface that defines what the client wants. And then design an abstract platform-oriented interface that defines what the platform provides. The platform interface should be minimal, necessary and sufficient. Add derived specialization classes for each concrete abstraction and map the client interface to the platform interface. And finally, add derived classes for each concrete platform. Here are some final comments. There are 
some similarities between the adapter and bridge patterns. Both map one object interface to another. However, the two patterns differ in how and when they are implemented. An adapter makes things work after they're designed. A bridge makes them work before they are designed. A bridge is designed up front to let the abstraction and the implementation vary independently. An adapter is retrofitted to make unrelated classes work together. And finally, you sometimes see the abstract factory pattern appear together with the bridge pattern. This is useful if the abstraction class needs to delegate the creation of the implementation class. For example, if the type of implementation depends on external factors that are only known at runtime. In that case, you can use the abstract factory pattern to create the implementation objects. OK, here is a summary of what we've learned in this lecture. The bridge pattern lets you combine two or more orthogonal class hierarchies. The pattern reduces the number of classes in your code and concentrates all implementation code in its own class hierarchy. The pattern provides the freedom to make changes to interface and implementation without breaking the architecture. You can provide the implementation at runtime by using an abstract factory to create the implementation objects. The pattern is similar to the adapter pattern, but it is intended for decoupling instead of adapting.